Hello and welcome to this panel here for Digital Tabletop Festival 4, Roll of the Dice, uh, hosted uh, by Oric Digital and presented to you on Steam. My name is Jess, uh, Jess Rutland, my pronouns are they, them. I'm a business development associate here at Oric Digital and I'm here joined by a lovely group of guests uh, who are going to talk about the topic of fear of the unknown and randomness and horror within video gaming and tabletop gaming. Uh, please, uh, could I'm going to pick on somebody, uh, Tom, please could you give us an introduction to yourself, uh, your studio, where you work, um, and anything that you're working on currently? Yes, I can most certainly do that. Uh, so I am Tom, uh, my pronouns are he, him, uh, and I work at Nomad Games uh, in Warrington. Um, so we're a very small studio who do digital tabletop games. Um, and we are currently working on Catan Console Edition and a unknown secret project that I can't talk about just yet. Ooh, ooh, I love a secret project. Uh, Marty, over to you. Hi, I'm Marty Shide. Uh, I work for Paradox Interactive in Stockholm. I am Polish, actually, but I live here in Stockholm. And uh, I specifically work on World of Darkness brand. I'm a community developer. And uh, in the brand team, we touch upon a lot of different projects from video games to board games to tabletop RPG uh, to, of course, make sure that the setting translates correctly to all of these things. So that'll be me. Nice. Thank you, Marty. Uh, Jeremy, over to you. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Jeremy. Uh, I pronounce he, him. Uh, I work for Stumlock Studios as a community manager. I do a little bit of writing and I'm just a general person between the players in the studio. Uh, and it is great to be here. Thank you. And finally, Sarah, a little intro, if you could. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so yeah, I'm Sarah, also she, they. Um, I am the senior narrative designer and writer at the Chinese Room, currently working on uh, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2. Uh, and yeah, that's me. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. So we've got a excellent band of experts, if I might say so myself, um, in kind of this theme of horror or horror adjacent um, as a genre. So when we're talking about this, we're also talking about anything that comes up as a typical trope in horror that can come across in games. They don't necessarily need to be, uh, you know, horror themselves as video games. Um, and what I'm interested to know is uh, a little bit of background to me is as well as business development, I'm also a neuroscientist. So by education and trade, I thought, well, neuroscience to business development in games, that seemed like the good pipeline to do. Um, so when it comes to understanding the human psyche and what goes on behind, you know, in our, in our thinking and our brains and what interests us and what we, what we like to bring across in games and what we like to create as well, I find that very, very interesting to investigate. So my first question really to, to everyone broadly uh, is when, when I say fear of the unknown, so what does that mean to you uh, in the context of tabletop gaming, in the, in the context of video gaming in general, or just abstractly, if you wanted to define fear or define the unknown, that's absolutely fine. Um, if anyone feels like they've got an answer, let me know. Uh, otherwise I will pick on people. I was going to say um, the thing that immediately comes to my mind with fear of the unknown is tension. Like I mm. always think of either tense situations, that feeling of tension before you get the answer to whatever you've asked, whether that be what's around the corner. Uh, will this be the resources that I need or will this be a big scary monster that I definitely did not want to see? Um, and I think that fear of the unknown and that tension that you feel like, I don't know if it, you'd necessarily call it the same thing, but it's definitely that tension mm. that you feel during the process of waiting to change what that fear is into something that's known. Mm, definitely. I suppose it's like, you've got this, you know, your body goes into its fight flight response. You've got all the cortisol and the stress hormones and everything going around and you're, you're in a position of you're ready to take action, depending on, you know, what 
you don't know what's going to come next so your body is just prepared for anything that could come up really and I think that's really interesting to to investigate um Sarah what about you do you have any thoughts yeah I mean I was just going to say the obvious which is that it's especially prevalent in tabletop where you're limited only by the imagination of the GM and the role of a dice and so it could literally be anything it's not a case of like you know with with games it's a little bit more limited because it depends on the scope of the game uh but obviously with with tabletop it could be literally anything and you know even being an expert in something doesn't necessarily guarantee success you can be like you know the world's greatest vampire and roll a one and that's still going to have consequences so you're never safe. And also with tabletop, there's no take backsies. Uh, unlike That's with games true. where you can just kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> save scum a little bit if you're playing Baldur's Gate 3, for instance. <laughs> and- yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I think, yeah, it's, there are no redos uh, in tabletop because it's, it's real time and your play, you know, your, your colleagues in your party are going to call you out on it. You know, for sure they will. Um, no takes backsies. Uh, Marty, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I kind of wanted to combine a little bit what Thomas and uh, Sarah have said, because I feel like, sure, with the fear of the unknown, not knowing what is behind those doors or in the darkness, and then uh, your imagination playing tricks on you, I feel like that's where the fun part of it comes. Because with your imagination, you start to go for various scenarios for what might be in these shadows. And that's probably the reason why we actually enjoy sometimes walking into the haunted abandoned houses or playing horror games because we want that imagination to give us oh my goodness what's going to happen when i open these doors and uh, uh, that's i feel like with the stress that's uh, of course is a little bit of a negative feeling there comes also the reward of trying to find out what's there yeah that's it's so interesting like yeah taking this these two almost diametrically opposing things which is fear and scared and and you know, being afraid, and then you've got fun and finding the fun in that. That's really interesting uh, as a concept, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know if Sarah, do you have do you have yeah. something to add on that one? Yeah, go for it, go for it. No, please do, please, I love it. Um, yeah, like that just got me thinking a way that, and sorry if this is a tangent, but um, I'm always very curious about the reasons that I grew up loving horror in particular. And it occurs to me that art is like, um it's like a zoo for emotions and we love experiencing horror because it's like when you go and see a tiger at a zoo and you know if you saw a tiger in the wild you'd probably be thinking oh ooh, i could die uh but seeing one at the zoo suddenly that terror is transformed into thrill and yeah. that's just so so interesting and it's kind of like this idea of i can uh run the simulations in my head of what i would do in the situation which is Surely, you know, it's, it's like kitten play. Uh, it's this sort of toying around with something which might one day be a real situation in a safe environment. And so I think, you know, especially for people who have, you know, gone through tragedy at a young age and things like that, it's almost like a, way, a thing that you get, that you latch onto mm. and you come entranced by because it's like, oh, okay, I've been taught by life that I need to know how to deal with these kinds of situations. So I'm going to put myself into this zoo of safe horror and learn how to cope with it and it just i don't know it's a bit of a tangent but i just find that so so interesting and like uh games and uh tabletop especially are just such exciting uh, ways to actually explore that because when you do it in film it's not the same because you don't you're not the one doing it you're watching someone else Mm. in games you're the one doing the kid and play you're the one in the zoo i just think that's really cool yeah Definitely. Jeremy, what about, what about you? I feel like, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm really glad Sarah brought that up because that's sort of what I've been thinking of this whole time is uh, Tom got me really thinking uh, about like that, that moment of tension, right? And like, why is that moment so tense? And it's because of a, like, and I hope I'm not projecting too hard here, but it's like that moment where you're totally lacking control. Because like, if you know what's behind the door, you can prepare for it. But if you don't know what's behind the door, you've totally lost control of the situation. You're just waiting for that little tidbit of information that you can grab onto and like do something with. And that's that tension. But 
uh, tabletop role play and stuff, and even uh, lots of other things people engage in, like horror in general movies and things like that, is a way to sort of safely let go of control mm. and let yourself go into those moments and safely think like, okay, what would I do if I only had like a split second to understand what was going on before I had to react to it? How do I let go of control of the moment and then and then like embrace the thrill? And uh, I, I think uh, ways to explore that through tabletop are, are really interesting to me. Uh, wow, I mean, this is this is getting my little uh, neuroscientist brain whirring right now because I'm really just <laughs> considering like all these aspects of the human psyche that makes us want to like, yeah, I mean, this 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 feeling of lacking control and wanting a safe space, and then also wanting to uh, finding um, kind of fun and empowerment in these safe spaces to be able to explore the things that concern us or upset us or that we're afraid of. It's, just, it's all very, very interesting. And it actually quite leads on quite nicely to my next point, which is, um, I'm just curious to know in everyone's perspective, uh, what do you think is more scary? Uh, a world full of uh, random chaos. So you never know what's going to happen next. There's no way to control or predict it or a completely deterministic world where you you lose that kind of aspect of, of free choice or you know what's going to happen next what what feels to you more scary um i don't know if anyone wants to start i'm probably going to go with marty this time do you want to give us some thoughts oh i, I feel like both can be scary because i'm immediately going in my brain and referencing horrors i've experienced uh, as media uh, and uh, what kind of uh, scenarios i found to be very um very upsetting or scary uh in my own brain and i feel like of course not knowing what is going to happen next is definitely a part of the horror so that's the chaos right you don't know what's going to happen next but knowing exactly what is going to happen next and that it's going to be the same scary thing over and over again can also be very scary like we all probably know pt and uh, uh yeah. other, the different horror scenarios in which the it's the the repeating loop that really is a part of the scare so i feel like not only both of them can be very scary but also like i feel like in some horror scenarios they actually come after the other uh, the absolute chaos for example and you not being able to ever know what is behind those doors becomes a pattern in itself so uh it's hard for me to choose one i feel like they are interconnected yeah, I would very much agree with that. Like I was thinking about it, thinking this is very much apples and oranges and you kind of want a little bit of both, really. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, yes, obviously we were talking about uh, fear of the unknown in TTRPGs and had that sense of, oh, anything could happen. But, you know, if you delve into philosophy and this idea of like, you know, predestination, that's terrifying as well. Like, you know, one thing that I've thought about in the past, okay, so this, this is a bit of a tangent and <laughs> very, very silly. Uh, so um, I've got a couple of friends who are really interested in astrology, for instance. And I was like, they, you know, they said, oh, Sarah, what's your star sign? And I said, oh, I think I'm a Gemini. And they were like, oh, okay. <laughs> and I was like, what, you know, like, what's wrong with being a Gemini? And uh, my friend uh, who's South African said that there's uh, a particular saying in South Africa, which is uh, sometimes a gem, always a nigh. And nigh is not a flattering word. I will let you look up what it means because it will get uh, deleted from the recording. <laughs> uh, but it actually really messed with me a little bit because I ended up sort of thinking like, you know, I don't believe in astrology, but if I did, like if I was wrong about that, there's this sense that because I was born in this particular month, I am predestined to be a night <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it got me quite upset thinking like does it what if like it doesn't mean that no matter what i do i will always be this thing and if anything more than the fact that i don't just generally you know don't believe astrology to be a thing i'm also like well i don't want it to be a thing now you know but anyway that was a tangent i had actually relevant things to say <laughs> um so for example um Yes, we were talking about how um, uh, the fear of the unknown is terrifying, but with predestination, um, it's, let me think about this. Um, so for example, 
when I was a kid, I overexposed myself to horror films at a really, really young age. Uh, so not much scares me now, which is, you know, something which is a source of disappointment. Uh, and it was really delightful and exciting uh, for me to find that the same thing didn't really translate to games. Uh, so in a film, I'm quite resigned because I'm watching this other person make linear decisions that I can't do anything about. Uh, if I know a jump scare is probably coming, I just have to simply accept that uh, because I chose to watch the film. And it's this notion that we see in therapy circles of like, you know, why worry about what you can't control, which kicks in. Um, but when you're the one in the hot seat, uh, when you know the jump scare is coming, that's actually a big source of terror because you were the one who has to trigger it. It's like the difference between waxing your own legs and going to the beautician. Because <laughs> you don't want to be the one to, to trigger the pain. And that introduces so much tension. Um, I can't remember who said it, but there was like someone there was someone online talking about this in horror a long time ago and how the most terrifying thing could be you know walking up to the thing that you know is going to scare you and it was something that didn't make it into the game but in very uh, early discussions about texas chainsaw massacre and what the tutorial might be for that it was a case of okay well everyone knows that the the sawyer house is where terrible things happen so what if the start of the game is about the journey up to the house as the player walking up to what you know is going to be that bad things await but you don't know what they will be and it's this wonderful interplay between the fear of the unknown and the sense of i know i'm walking to my doom but what's it going to be that's everything Oof. i swear <laughs> Oof. walking to your doom that that's a strong that's a that's a strong phrase i think um tom do you, what do you think about walking to your doom uh i'd rather not personally um <laughs> when it comes to uh, uh, it's i was thinking about the deterministic well that the idea that you know you have to walk to your doom or you don't know what's going to be around the corner uh when you finally get to your doom and i was thinking about it in terms of game design and i was thinking about it in terms of you know what kind of feedback we get from our players and i was like it's it's interesting that both the idea that there's just pure chaos and the idea that it is already entirely written out, there's no deviation, like both of those ideas are terrifying. Like mm. we want to live in that middle ground where some things are determined, some things aren't. Like some things we can't control, some things we can. And the idea that it would go to either of those extremes is just too much. Um mm. And I think from a game design point of view, we need like game designers and some of the best games out there lean into making sure that neither of those extremes are presented. Because if you play a game where if you roll a one, you win. If you roll a six, you lose and you don't have any agency otherwise. That's a pretty boring game. Like that's pure chaos. You have no involvement. There's no choices to be made. That's boring. If you play a game where if you roll one through six, you win. There's no mm. tension. There's no interest there. Um, and I think some of the best games and some of the best horror experience uh, experiences that people tend to come to and come back to and really celebrate are those games that really toe the line between giving players enough that they can control uh, and enough that is just completely random and out of their hands um so to answer the question of which one do i think is more scary i think both of them are pretty scary which is the <laughs> both answer. are pretty terrifying no 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 that's fine that's fine we'll <laughs> accept that yeah, thank you, thank you, Tom. Like, I, I, I know you say it's a bit of a cop out answer, but honestly, like, it's, it's absolutely fine. Like, both are just as terrifying as each other. Um, I mean, Jeremy, what do you think? Are you, are you also in the camp of, um, you know, a deterministic world or a chaos world of both? Just as scary. What, what do you feel like you'd lean towards if you had to pick one? Uh, so for this, I guess. Uh, so a while ago, I tried to play a tabletop game called uh, Call of Cthulhu. 
and nice. it's it was my first time trying to tackle DMing like a horror tabletop, and it had me thinking a lot about like how do I do horror in tabletop with like players uh, when it feels like horror is a lot about like what sort of information you have and what sort of information you don't have, uh, and that's a big thing with like predetermined and whether or not it, it's completely random. Like if you don't know either way, neither one is scary. But if you know something is coming, like if you're sitting in the dentist chair and the dentist says what's supposed to be comforting and they're like, uh, hey, you know, if it hurts, just let me know and we'll put more stuff in there. And you're like, is it going to wait? <laughs> so any moment it could be incredibly painful. OK, cool. I'll just be here. Uh, that knowing that something really bad could happen at any second uh, is a sort of like is like a sort of terror. So it's about the knowledge of it. And so the idea I played with in the Call of Cthulhu thing was that I made a creature that would make the characters forget about it after they had seen it. Like once it was out of their point of view, they forgot that it existed. So they, the players, would be aware of things them, the characters, were not aware of. And the players would be aware that they were walking into a trap or that something horrible had just happened, but their characters weren't. Uh, and it just sort of played with that idea of like, you know something predeterminedly awful is going to happen and you have to just walk into it. And how do you deal with that? Mm. Uh, so I think personally predetermined is way scarier. <laughs> the randomness <laughs> is just like anything random could happen at any time, sure. But if you know something is coming and you just have to sit with it, that that scares the hell out of me. So you're very I much in the camp that, of... Sorry. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. You're very much in the camp of like, if it's out of your control, you can just sit back and then you don't have to worry about it because it's it's not your business it's not your you know not your circus not your monkeys i believe is the, the yeah, saying like every i'm horribly afraid of heights every time i go flying uh and the flight like starts to take off and like the taking off and the landing is the worst part but every time the plane starts to take off i just go like if i die I die <laughs> you know like <laughs> what am i gonna do about it now and that genuinely calms me down but like the, if I was just, if I didn't take that moment to accept it, I'd be terrified the whole flight. I just want to say I'm so sold on this idea right now because honestly, with the chaos, let's say it's a very simple video game. You have 33% you're gonna get a muffin, 33% you're gonna get a hug, 33% you're gonna get a horrible death, and then for the tournament, you are always going to get horrible death. So I would prefer chaos for sure. <laughs> 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 so much better. <laughs> Yeah, at least but with chaos, like you feel Tom like you have a chance. It. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like Tom <laughs> yeah. said at the very beginning, I would prefer not to. <laughs> I would but prefer there's... not to walk to my doom. Yeah. There's a flip side as well, though, because you know, yes, you have a chance, but also that agency's in your hands. That's a lot of responsibility. You can't just say, All "Right, I'm going to," you know, offset that to someone else. Uh, my fate is in your hands. <laughs> okay, just take me. Like you have mm -hmm. to think, like, what if, like, you know, you get the the self doubt what if I'm not good enough? Like, what if I can't do this? What if there was a possibility to save myself, but because I'm a dumbass, like, I couldn't do it. So I don't know if that counts as swearing. Uh <laughs> Maybe. Like, sort of the idea, like, that you, what if you can't accept that you have no control? What if you yeah. are saying, like, you doubt yourself or you doubt the situation, you say, like, if there's even the slightest chance that I can. Yeah. And that, like, almost like the hope turns against you. Yeah. Like the fact that you have hope is horrible. Exactly. It's kind of like when you have those dreams that you're really weak and it feels like, you know, you're trying to defend yourself, but it feels like punching underwater. And it's mm. a situation where in the dream you're like, I should be able to deal with this. Like, you know, uh, this is silly, but I went to Australia when I was 15 and I kept running through simulations of what I would do if a shark came to me. I was like, right, I'm going to punch it. I'm going <laughs> to jump on its back. I'm going to ride that shark. <laughs> I'm gonna like hook my like fingers around its mouth and like like reins and just like ride it to shore. <laughs> Pretty sure it wouldn't work out like that. <laughs> and you know, it's it's that idea that we always tell ourselves like, oh, I can deal with that. But then, what if you can't? Mm. And it's terrifying. I'd almost rather resign myself to my fate. And like like you were saying, Jeremy, you know, on the plane, because I get the same thing. And I just came back from Iceland, and you know, we were. Oh, our flight actually got cancelled in the end but we were sat on the plane and there was a storm going on outside and the plane hadn't taken off but there was like turbulence while we were still on the ground we were getting rocked around by the wind like still on the ground and I was thinking this is how I die but there's <laughs> nothing I can do so you know Jesus take the wheel you know <laughs> oh, no. but yeah I'm coming back though I really love 
that idea that you were talking about, Jeremy, with the um, in was it called Cthulhu, where mm. everyone forgets that dramatic irony is absolute chef's kiss, <laughs> and it got me thinking. You know, that's the role of music in mm. in the horror. It's like that's the reason why it's there because there might be nothing tipping you off that a scene is you know that something's coming, but then you hear the Ooh, and you just, you just know you just know. Yeah oh, I gotta, be, I gotta be afraid. And so that interplay between, you know, I'm gonna say departments because we work in games, but like, mm -hmm. you know, um, all those different art forms working together to kind of like undercut each other. Because the narrative could be saying, everything's fine. Like for example, Game of Thrones, the uh, infamous red wedding, la la la, everything's fine, everything's fine, we're enjoying a happy wedding. But then Reigns of Castamere starts to play. Yep. And we know what Reigns of Castamere means, mm -hmm. even if the rest of the characters don't. I mean, obviously Cat knows, but the rest of them don't. And so there was mm -hmm. la, 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 la. And so, and that dramatic irony is where we find our tension. And oh, I just love it. Yeah, that's, that, oh, that's so brilliant. The, the way you can use music to, to sort of impose that meta knowledge is, is so good. Uh, and I think that's a big part of uh, writing and, and just how we present like art and storytelling has a lot to do with being aware of like what the meta knowledge of, of like, in our case, players, like what they're thinking and, and knowing how to like play with those expectations. I, I yes. think that's a great example of how you do that. Like really brilliant example. Exactly. And also it's, I guess, yeah, it's its own form of foreshadowing because that's mm -hmm. the thing, like, you know, uh, Again, a scene might play out and it's on the surface absolutely fine, but because we have this one piece of foreshadowing, we're like, I, like I've had a feeling this whole time that that one thing that happened earlier is going to mean something. Because as an audience, we've kind of been trained to recognize when something's important and when something mm -hmm. is going to be a premonition, essentially, to something mm -hmm. disastrous, perhaps. And so we're waiting for it. And that's the most wonderful thing to play with as an artist is just plopping these things in and then being like, da, 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 I'm going to pretend like I didn't know that I did that. Yeah. Uh, and watching people react to it. It's just, yeah, it's so much fun. Gosh, Sarah, the, the, the places that your mind goes to is amazing. I love it <laughs> so much. Um, I love the, I just, I love this image of you, like, rip tearing on the back of a shark. I think that's fantastic. Um, <laughs> absolutely amazing. Um, so, actually, that was based on uh, something, a, a story that I wrote when I was about eight. Uh, that whole, like, scenario in my head of just, like, this is what I would mm. do. When I was eight, uh, at school, we had to write these short stories, and I wrote something about a megalodon, and it's like the scientist on a ship, and like she gets like eaten by a megalodon, but she grabs on to its tongue, so it's fine. And then there's like a whole group of people who also got, you know, they also latched onto the tongue, and they all like go, they, you know, just split into 50 50 at each side of the mouth, and they start like yanking at the side of this megalodon's mouth to like like rains just like direct it to shore and i'm really proud of it you should be <laughs> sorry it's like we show our thoughts you know like when you're in the shower and you come up with those like wild stories in your brain it's like what would i do i would hold a tongue <laughs> yeah <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> oh my gosh inspired oh. and this could only come from a, a narrative writer honestly I feel like this is yeah <laughs> absolutely um Jeremy could you talk to how V Rising handles horror as you're playing a vampire and so you have some control or ability to take control from the start um but also you're newly risen and I know you just kind of talked about this idea that actually you would prefer the chaos of everything that that feels pretty good for you but I guess V Rising, first of all, where does it sit within horror? Is it more horror adjacent with classic horror tropes that come into it? I'm just curious to pick your brain a little bit more on on that. Well, it's really interesting uh, for me because, like, uh, I wasn't there for the conception of V Rising, but I've uh, obsessively bothered people who have been, uh, especially about like the themes and like the ideas and sort of what inspired, especially like the art direction and just like the ideas of the game. And the whole idea of the game was kind of like, what if you took a survival game and completely turned it on its head? Like 
in a survival game, you're kind of like, you're dropped in the middle of the woods and you're like naked and you're only really safe during the day. But like, what if you took, uh, and there's like things encroaching at night that are always terrifying. But what if it was the other way around? What if you were the terrible thing dropped in the middle of the, the, the dark, uh, withered and forgotten and having to claw your way back up from, from nothing to be the terror? And what if you're only safe at night? What if when the sun's out, you're literally burning to death? Uh, what if you're starting from the bottom and eating rats? Uh, so it has like a lot of horror sort of like themes and ideas and a lot of like the language of horror built into it, especially with inspirations from like, you know, Bram Stoker's Dracula and a lot of like classic horror. Um, but uh, in the actual gameplay, it's more of a feeling and ambiance that they sort of communicate like... Uh, throughout the the architecture and just uh, just the general artwork and the sound design and everything but there's this one part of the game that i really love especially because i got to i'm in charge of beta testing uh in a lot of ways so i got to see the first time players experience things sometimes and one of the favorite things one of my favorite moments of all time was we have this area called the cursed forest and the cursed forest used to be kind of like uh the idea of is we want to have this choking terrible place that you like descend into and like get lost in this like terrible swamp uh but before it was just sort of like we try to sort of do that by you know you walk down into the thing and the place is just generally kind of confusing but you have a map you got a mini map you, you can find your way around pretty easily but uh in our last update we added a new mechanic where when you go in there you steadily start to a fog starts to like steadily kind of take over your your screen uh, it reduces your visual radius and also your mini map starts to get blurry and then eventually it's totally fogged over and then your map also gets totally fogged over. So we had had players who had played before and did not know about this new mechanic. And I was just sort of following them in invisible mode while they were walking through here. And uh, we have like area voice chat. So hearing them experience at the same time for the first time this fog rolling in and them losing sight of each other and then also, like, the aggro radius of monsters is, like, just sort of outside of your vision. So, like, they're walking through. They're, like, calling out to try to figure out where each other are. They're screaming as, like, things start to attack them out of the mist. And it, this, uh, this moment of, like, having had a certain sense of things and then having it taken away from you in a way that's unexpected and then having to cope with that. And it, it created, like, this thrilling sort of horror moment that I feel like we didn't have in our game before. And it made me so happy <laughs> to see, uh, one, because it was funny, but two, because like it was cool to see someone have like a really genuinely like horrific experience in their game in, in a fun way. Very nice. So yeah, that, that's that's sort of one way in which we have sort of started to embrace horror. A little I bit love more. that. I really, really love that. I mean, like you were saying, like it, it's what an experience to have to see it in real time like such an authentic reaction from all of the players and to know that you achieved that like to, you set out with a goal and the goal was to to create an environment that could really terrify players who were already like i suppose used to the game right they knew what to expect now at this point these were mm -hmm. seasoned players and you found a way to to subvert their expectations that's pretty cool um that's mm -hmm. very satisfying as a developer i think to be able to do um subverting player expectations um yeah uh i was really sold on this environment like i loved it from the time like it was conceived and it was like presented in like a little powerpoint presentation to us and i was like really excited for it and then when we actually delivered i was like you know i feel like we could do more and then when we actually did do more and they actually found a way to deliver the experience it was so satisfying yeah. it's it's a really good feeling when you so just for a little bit of context to players back at home, no, anyone who hasn't been part of game dev before, often we can have these these stretch goals or these like this this wish list of all the things we would love to be able to bring to a video game or a tabletop game, but realistically, because of budget or anything like that, we can't achieve those mm -hmm. those most of the time. But on those occasions when we can, when we can take like a could or something from the wish list and we can implement it, it's the most satisfying thing to be able to do, and it's a great great feeling um as developers so i'm glad you had yes. that kind of similar feeling and that opportunity there jeremy <laughs> um that's really cool i'm excited to to play through that area actually um I'm, i've i've dabbled in a bit of e rising in the past so i'm excited to to come to it it gets weird later so, so. ready so <laughs> ready <that>. um <laughs> marty uh just swinging over to you a little bit um so 
World of Darkness, you're here for World of Darkness. Uh, it is a very, very well-beloved uh, IP, fondly referred to by the community as Goth Punk. When I was doing a little bit of research, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of Goth Punk esque elements, and it made me start to think about the the gothic and horror, and how those two can be entwined, and how they can have like different kind of elements of each other and show up in each other as genres. Um, so I just kind of wanted to talk to you about like what role does goth as an archetypal horror trope play in your games, especially because I know we're talking here like eight plus different tabletop RPGs at this point. Um, but yeah, so so goth, what does goth mean to you within this? Thank you for adding that. Uh, what does goth mean, mean to you personally? Because I think goth means different things to different people. And uh, if, like uh, there might be some arguments, you know, for some people, it is more connected to the style of music, for example, or to fashion or to subculture that they participated in actively or uh, to to, again, tropes in in media. For me, I was introduced to this term originally when I was, and that's very much related to my current work, actually, which is kind of funny. When I was 12, 13, I was a very young teenager, um, and I liked things dark. <laughs> and uh, I started dressing in black, and I was 14 when my brother, uh, I have an older brother who brought me a copy of Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. That's how I was, I was introduced to the whole setting, and it found me in the perfect time. I was probably a little bit too young for it, um, <laughs> it didn't really matter. Actually, it was a part of the charm. It was a part of this discovering the secret world full of fascinating things that I was both scared of and fascinated in. And coming from a very small town, uh, as when I was younger, I explored this whole town. And I thought I knew it perfectly, and it became very, very boring very quickly and very small, very containing. So, this, rediscovering some paths and trying to imagine that there is something more in these shadows that maybe in this building a vampire could live. It looks a little bit like that, and kind of discovering this world together while discovering my whole neighborhood and my surroundings yet again by trying to come up with the stories of how World of Darkness would look like if it was in my town. That made me enjoy things again a little bit. You know, it made it made my world bigger. It made the shadows deeper. It made the mystery that I was trying to to find and everything. And that was gothic for me. And that was goth for me. The shadows being longer, the darkness being darker, the characters in this world all being extremely fascinating while at the same time having probably some terrible secrets, but you want to discover them. You want to get to know them better. And you are an active part of this world. You are cool for being a part of this world. You dress fun. You listen to a moody music. For a teenager me, that was my defining factor. It was it was everything for me. And as I grew, of course, um, and I discovered, you know, uh, more depth in, in World of Darkness and, and I was uh, kind of, it was on the path with me as I was growing older. And now when I joined uh, the company that actually works on it and started to look from it behind the scenes, it still rings true. It doesn't really differ from how I perceived it as a naive 14 year old who just played Bloodlines. It is still about the same thing. It's about our world, the places we know, the places we are familiar with, our cities, uh, the buildings we recognize from, from our surroundings, but there is a secret in there. It is our world, but with secrets hidden in its darkest corners that are just super exciting to uncover. And uh, it makes every day more interesting when you go through various places you visit as an, as an adult and you just explore the cities thinking about, oh, that could be a very cool place for to set up a Vampire the Masquerade game or a World of the Apocalypse game because I feel like this, this actually very much fits the setting. <laughs> so yeah, that is go for me. Uh, the, the surroundings that are around us made darker and cooler at the same time because of this added mystery to them. And uh, I feel like the subculture of music and everything just goes into that. That was that's really, really poetic, actually, I think, as a way to phrase that. And it resonates with me a lot personally as well. And I'm sure a lot of folks watching at home, too, is an authenticity, I think, to 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 the genre and to the environment around you and for you to to feel as well like as a both a consumer of it and then coming to work for world of darkness behind the scenes and to feel like that still rang true that same 
flavor that same that same feeling that you were getting that that was consistent I think that that's incredible that's that's almost magical I think for 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 something to be able to do that for somebody um so thank you for for sharing that that's really really awesome um I mean this is this is nice because it this is gothic as like a broad concept I suppose but to dial in a little bit more I kind of wanted to turn to Sarah if that's all right um We've spoken about the gothic in general, Sarah, the conventions of horror and how these can come across in tabletop settings, fear of the unknown. We've covered a lot of stuff here so far in this discussion. Um, As a digital adaptation, how does Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 make use of these same conventions? Um, So in other words, how would you describe horror as a genre versus horror as a feeling um, in Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2? So obviously everyone's really familiar with horror as a genre and for people who don't engage a lot with it, um, they think of horror and they think of, you know, the the films that come out that go straight to Netflix where it's like horror is just, it's just jump scares. And they're just like, oh, it's the classic formulaic thing of person goes into haunted house, you know, mass murderer, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just going to be scared all the time or, you know, ideally. Um However, that's not all horror is. And, you know, people who play Bloodlines, especially Bloodlines 1, uh, will probably debate, you know, is Bloodlines horror? Because we have vampires, you know, we have, you know, in the wider world of darkness, you know, there are werewolves, there are ghosts, uh, there are demons. um, And those are conventions of horror, the kind of the set dressing. Uh, And so I just find it a really interesting space uh, between the two when you have horror as something which you can just lean completely into, but then you can also use it as a set dressing to create something new. So um, sort of dial back slightly. So as we know from Bloodlines 1, uh, we're using vampires, but it also explores lots of different emotions. A lot of Bloodlines 1 is actually really funny. And so you're exploring uh, comedy and then, you know, there'll be some drama, some intrigue, and, you know, each mission is kind of its own subgenre within it. Um, and I often find that the best stories come from, not from saying, well, I'm writing a horror story so that everything has to be for horror. It's about having this sort of material genre and then the story within it could be a different genre. And that actually creates a new thing. It kind of augments it. So everything has the kind of tone and vibe of the outer genre, but then the inner genre creates its own brings its own emotions to the table, which augment uh, with the with the outer genre. So, for example, using a, a different example from Bloodlines, um, The Haunting of Hill House. Actually, no, The Haunting of Blind Manor, which I absolutely adore. Um, you know, it's, it's in the script itself. It says, this isn't a horror story. This is, you know, a tragedy. It's a romantic tragedy with all the gothic, you know, setting that give it its own... Uh, vibe it's like you know when you take a photo and then put an instagram filter on it and you can make it feel really warm or really cold or really grainy and that changes the fundamental thing and you get these two this combination creates something completely new like sweet and salty popcorn (laughs) uh and it's just delicious in its own way that you know just sweet or just salt can't do on their own uh and for me that's the most interesting uh, space in in horror and the great thing is is when you're using horror as set dressing it means you can dip into full horror at any point and the, you know the stage is set for that uh you know the audience is prepared for that uh so you can have like a bunch of you know comedy missions or like a more dramatic mission and then you can have a horror mission and it just you just you just slide straight into the horror and then you can slide back out and you can just dip in and out of the horror and it just feels natural because the outer genre provides this consistency of tone mm. that you know flows under everything which is just really cool and that's one of the reasons i really like bloodlines because it, it really nails that idea of like we are in this universe the universe feels like this but we can also explore different things it's not one note yeah. it's 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 constantly taking you on a different journey so kind of tangenting slightly um but yeah uh let's see what was i gonna say so 
obviously the thing with vampire and you know uh, jeremy was talking about this earlier and obviously marty or world of darkness too the thing with vampire is that you are the monster so it's not the traditional horror of like i'm the powerless one and i'm running from the monster and if i'm right actually i think world of darkness was one of the first uh movers in the you are the vampire versus the vampire is the monster uh which is really really cool but also yeah how does that change like if you're writing a, a horror in which you do sometimes at least sometimes wants the audience to be afraid how do you make it scary when you are the monster because i know that when i play the texas chainsaw massacre or friday the 13th if i'm playing as jason or leatherface like it's a completely different experience from playing as the victims because i'm just having a power trip just running around with a chainsaw and it's just fun <laughs> uh so but with vampire like jeremy was saying you have this this other strand of like okay well what's scary for a vampire you know and obviously there are notions of like it's like maslow's hierarchy of needs right you've got your physiological right at the bottom and a vampire has these very strong physiological needs of i can't be exposed to sunlight for example like i have to feed and you know that brings with it its own tension on that physiological level but as we climb the pyramid there are also these other sources of different kinds of fear mm. and again you know someone who is not familiar with horror might look at horror and say oh there's the scares are just you know they're jump scares whatever that's that's cheap and they're right it is cheap because someone who's more of a horror aficionado will say actually i'm interested in the horror that comes from knowing that you're going to have to watch everyone you love mm. die and if you don't want to you're going to have to turn them into a mm. monster and if you want to survive you're going to have to be a monster you're going to have to breach people's consent by feeding on them and that is monstrous and you know obviously in a video game there's this whole thing of you know it's not real it's fun you know it, it's fun to be mean to the npcs but like sometimes depending mm. on who you are um but oh God, what was i gonna say um yeah it's just something really interesting to dig into like the fear of ennui the fear of you know what if uh eternity becomes really boring um what if, you know, another thing that comes with it is in Vampire especially, knowing that you're never going to be able to feel the things that you felt, the way you felt them when you were human. You know, there's, you know, yes, you can still experience things like, you know, lust. And maybe there's a kind of love in there somewhere, but everything's twisted because everyone is a monster. And, you know, humanity has been sacrificed mm. here. And you have to sacrifice humanity kind of every time you feed. Yeah. And so... What does that turn you into like is someone like that still capable of love are you still capable of trust what must it be like to go through eternity knowing that no one is really trustworthy and you can never really get truly close to anyone i really like, i really feel that's... like i really feel like i'm going through like a therapy session here or something Sarah. like no but it's, it, this is this is all really great stuff because it's it's really digging down into this idea of a set dressing and it really strikes me how versatile horror can be yeah. actually um being able to find the humor and the drama and the romance and the fun and the fear and the terror it's actually one of the most versatile kind of tropes that we have within our arsenal within media within gaming that kind of thing and i think that's fantastic gosh i mean the, the places that your mind goes to, Sarah, are absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm always in awe. Um, I mean, Tom, would you would you be able to speak to, to horror as a trope in Fury of Dracula? Because I'm just aware that, you know, we've been talking about a lot of this, like, fear of the unknown and about uh, different genres and the versatility of horror as well so far in the panel, which I think is a really interesting point in that horror especially when using horror tropes it opens up this whole narrative for humor and fun and and drama and romance as well as the things that are typically scary so i suppose for you tom would you be able to speak about horror as a trope in fury of dracula um at all or any of your other titles yes absolutely um i think the most interesting thing that i can probably launch straight into with fury of dracula which is the thing most worth talking about is the fact that because Fury of Dracula is a 1v4 board game and one of the people playing plays as Dracula, you have a very interesting dynamic where you, instead of having 
a bunch of players who are going against a horror GM. You have someone who has a very strict set of rules as playing as Dracula, but can set up the tension. They can set up what they are going to experience during the game. And that cat and mouse gameplay that you experience during Fury of Dracula really leans into that horror and that tension that we've talked about um, in the panel so far. And I think having the movements of Dracula be hidden and having it be a 1v4 situation as someone that's played as both the uh, Hunters and Dracula, it's a very cool experience when you get to play as Dracula because you're sitting there watching four people who have no real idea where you are. They have little clues. They they might have theories about where you are, but they don't know exactly where you are. And you get to see how that fear of the unknown really comes into play when you have limited information. So you're sitting there saying, they know I could be in one of three possible locations, or at least that's what they think they know. Um, and being able to witness that fear of the unknown properly play out during a game um, is mm. something I think is really unique to Fury of Dracula. I know obviously you can have that within tabletop games, but I think the actual versus component, like you're actually trying to take down Dracula or you're trying to evade the hunters, um, means it has a really unique spin to it um, that I think Fury of Dracula brings. Very nice. I, I really like that, and it links really nicely as well to the what the other panelists were talking about earlier, which is that almost power trip that you can have. Like you were saying, how fun it is to to play as Dracula, and the other players don't know what you're getting up to. Like you and what we were speaking about earlier with predeterminism, and like knowing what's going to happen next and what's actually the scarier thing to happen it's when you have that kind of control when you are dracula you you can lead the direction a little bit more in the game i suppose um because the players don't know what's going to happen whereas you do which is interesting yeah, i know think... i'm personally a fan of games like that hmm. and i think as well when you have to consider what your human opponents are going to be thinking about that adds an entire new level of second guessing and unknown factors and you can't account for how risky or how safe someone else is going to play um, and i think a lot of horror comes from trying to understand someone else's thoughts which is a whole absolutely terrifying thing to try and do uh especially when you're fighting against someone on a board game yeah yeah definitely um it reminds me a lot as well of um another um board game which is uh betrayal house on the hill i'm sure you've heard of that one a lot of folks probably have at this point but i just i love it when without going into too much detail you are all working together in this haunted house and you're exploring it and then all of a sudden one of you becomes a traitor and you don't know what their next move is and the traitor doesn't know what everyone else's next move are um so it's heroes versus traitor and it's all unknown and it you, you all of a sudden you're dealt a whole new different set of cards and a different set of chance and possibilities ahead of you i think that kind of subversion really interests me in games and in game design yeah for it's sure a def it's a very interesting space to play in um yeah for sure It's really emblematic, I think, of all of the panelists that we've brought here today um, and what they, you know, what they find in their games. Um, I'm just trying to, like, bring this, bring this to a little bit of a close now. And I like to, like, do a little quick lightning round for everyone just before we finish off, which is, um, do you have any horror games that you've played personally that you would like to mention? Lightning round. You've got a minute each. Uh, Marty, starting with you. All right. Uh, do play Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. <laughs> it's actually really fun. Uh, and of course, do play Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines too uh, once it arrives, because I feel like it, it's going to be a worthy successor. And uh, yeah, I also want to... Um, I, I can be, of course, um, very... Um, uh, like, like 
try to recommend things that I was somehow involved in, like, for example, Rave the Oblivion Afterlife, which is also great if you have a VR set. But I want to also recommend uh, things that I was kind of raised on and that are absolutely amazing. Silent mm. Hill 2, just mm. my favorite horror ever, probably, which touches on all of these uh, topics in here. And um, yeah, just uh, check out a lot of the wonderful indie creators creating indie horrors on Steam because there's tons of amazing stuff to explore. Uh, and more are coming with every month. So mm. I haven't caught up to everything that is out there, but one day when I retire. <laughs> <laughs> yes, perfect. Thank you so much, Marty. Uh, Jeremy, over to you. Um, okay, so uh, one horror game I played, the only one that ever made me actually just quit playing it was uh, Amnesia mm. The Dark Descent. I just straight mm -hmm, up didn't mm -hmm. finish it. I hit a certain point where I saw something, I was just like, nope, I closed the game and I never opened it up again. Uh, but in terms of like a, a game that I want to play and I've played like a little bit of uh, and I would recommend anyone check out is uh, World of Horror. It's a game that is pretty recent. It's got like a very like Junji Ito kind of style and it's just like masterfully put together and, and like captures this very like going out into a world of the unknown and facing horror every day and just slowly falling apart and it's 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 just it's very good uh, i would strongly recommend it. stunning it thank you jeremy and sarah uh yeah i did not get very far through amnesia uh, <laughs> at all <laughs> um but you know if if you like that sort of thing then Oh my god, the game that the rest of our studio is working on uh, still wakes the deep. Um, yeah, I won't be able to finish that either, based on what I played of that. It's going to be a similar story to Amnesia, so uh, if you like that sort of thing, then have fun. Uh, but the other thing I would re recommend, actually, that I played the whole of, uh, Slay the Princess, mm. uh, which yes. came out recently. Yes, yes everyone's enthusiastic. <laughs> it's so good, and you know, uh, again, if you were to say like, oh, but I'm talking about, you know, amnesia type horror, then yes, it's not that. It's horror in the sense that we've been talking about of like, what are the different kinds of horror? And actually, you know, the whole idea of predestination because you're in this loop and you know that the world ends uh, if you don't do X thing. And you also know you're very likely to get killed every single yeah, time. Yeah. It's, you know, you have that walking up to the cabin where you know the princess is and it's yeah if you want to experience the different kinds of horror in the like the more acquired subtle tastes the if you want a tasting a tasting menu for horror then uh yeah slay the princess Great game. stunning uh what about you tom um if you could pick some horror games what would you quickly you know times of the essence what what would your picks yeah that you'd like to mention uh i've got to mention my all-time favorite resident evil 4 I think it's got such an amazing balance between the camp that you get in a lot of horror, um, the action that you get in a lot of horror, and then the straight up horror that you get in a lot of horror. Like that's a game that is full of moments of tension and knows exactly when to take you on a massive high knows when to give you time to relax it knows it's just paced like no other game i've ever played and mm. i can play it over and over and over again and still be absolutely blown away by how well it's designed so i'm sure you were delighted uh when they did the remaster the remake of it sorry um you must have been very very happy oh yes oh yes i've been waiting for that for a <laughs> very long time Day one purchase, it's got to happen. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Thank you all so, so much. Uh, I'd be remiss, of course, not to mention our beautiful, lovely titles, none of which could really be horror. Uh, but um, I will probably say, please go play 40, 000, uh, Warhammer 40,000 Bolt Gun. Um, it's very gory, very retro, beautiful boomer shooter. Uh, please, please, please check that out if you just want to rip and tear. Uh, for the emperor just go for it mars horizon brewmaster if you need if you need a moment to like chill out and calm down from everyone else's games that they've recommended we we can provide we can provide something for you instead just to calm your nerves a little bit afterwards um so thank you very much for everyone uh for taking part in this panel today you can check out all of the information in the description below about all of our panelists the games that we've discussed anything that anyone's come up with uh 
check it all out below but otherwise thank you so much for watching thank you so much for taking part in digital tabletop fest for roll of the dice and we will see you next time thank you